Hey everybody, my name's Chuck Allward. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, what were those items that you found? <laughs> if we can come up with a set of keys, I'll leave now. <laughs> uh, I'm a grateful alcoholic and uh, grateful to be here tonight. Uh, really nervous for some reason. I was fine until, uh, until I sat down. Uh, I'll try not to say uh, too many times. Brent's wearing off on me over there. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm a member of this home group, keeping it sober group. Uh, my sobriety date is March 16th, 1993. March 18th, I'm sorry, I'm trying to steal two days. March 18th, 1993, my sister's birthday is March 16th. Not 93, though, she's older than me, but I won't tell you how much older. But, uh, you know, I'm a member of this home group, and, and I'm grateful to be asked to speak anywhere, else, but it's really a, a privilege to be, to be asked to speak at your home group. And, it's been a couple of years since I spoke here in Aberdeen, so, you know, not a whole lot's changed since then other than I got older and, and, and I've stayed sober a couple of more years since then. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, I've been thinking a little bit. Richard asked me last week, and I, I was supposed to be out of town on a little golfing thing with some of the AA guys this weekend, and I had to back out because I'm just too busy at work. And, you know, I guess God, God's will for me was to be here to speak tonight. Not, not that I'm going to, you know, probably say anything that's going to help anybody, but I know maybe something's going to come out of it that'll, that'll help me stay sober another day. But I was thinking a little bit, you know, this week about, first of all, I'd like to I tell you all that I, I dressed up tonight out of necessity. I've worked the last 28 days in a row, and I didn't have anything clean other than a pair of old underwear and this suit. So that's why I've got it on. But uh, laundry hadn't been a real uh, priority. But uh, I was taught that you know, any time I get up in front of a pro, the, behind the podium in Alcoholics Anonymous, I should try to represent this program uh, to to any newcomer that may be there at their first meeting that they would see that this is a program that works, you know, and 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 to, and and to represent it, you know, with with a message of hope, and and you know, not to talk like I'm still out there on the street, and uh, to try to dress, you know appropriately and you know just by chance the guy that taught me all that stuff might have been in town this weekend and been at this meeting I didn't want him to be ashamed of me so that's why I wore this suit <laughs> and uh, you know I'm grateful for guys like that because you know today I'll be honest with you we were, we're more worried about hurting a new man's feelings than saving his life I mean it's a shame but uh, when I came around you know they didn't care what about your feelings they wanted you to get better you know and I'm grateful for that but uh you know, I'm supposed to tell what it was like, what happened, what it's like today, and basically what that is is, you know, uh, talk about what alcohol did to me, but, but without, to really describe what alcohol did to me, I need to talk, tell you what alcohol did for me. That's what's really important. And to do that, I need to talk about how I felt before I got to alcohol. You know, and I come from a family, a great family. There was never any alcohol in our house. My mom and dad are still married. They're 54, 55 years together despite me and my brother. And, uh, you know, all my sisters are, are just as pretty normal. One of them may have an issue or whatever, but they all went through college and are, are professionals and have done great, you know. And, and on, on the male side, you know, me and my brother both had issues. We've both been sober a while. My brother will be celebrating 20 years in, in uh, recovery in July. So, uh, you know, it's been a pretty good run for us. But uh, I was never around any alcohol. There was never alcohol in the house, you know. I mean, it, I've never seen my dad drunk, never seen my mom take a drink. You know, the only time I can ever remember as a kid had any alcohol being, anything about alcohol, one of my dad's friends from, from the power company that he worked for came over and he dropped his flask out in the, out in the driveway and it, and it broke. And I can remember hearing my mom and dad laugh about it. I guess the guy must have been drunk or something. And, uh, you know, I... All I knew about alcohol before I started really drinking was that, you know, in the, in the cowboy movies, when a guy got shot, they poured one on the wound and they gave him one to drink. I was like, that stuff must be pretty dad blame good, you know. And I couldn't, you know, I, I never really thought about drinking, but, 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 you know, I was a guy who just, just never really could get comfortable. You know, I mean, I was ill at ease, maladjusted, discontented, uh, I mean, what about hands? I mean, what do you do with your hands? I mean, you know, it's no matter what kind of situation I was in, 
I never felt like my hands were right, you know, you put them in your pockets or you hold them up here or, you know, I mean, they should give us a button so we can press it and our hands will disappear when we get in, in situations that are uncomfortable. You know, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but you let me get around a room full of pretty women or something or somewhere where I'm not comfortable and it happens to me even today, you know, my hands are like, what do I do with them? Where do, where should I, put them? Like, I know they notice them, you know, but, uh. I'm tell you, so that's me, you know, and I'm going along here, and I mean, you know, alcohol would have been great about then, but I didn't have any, and, I, you know, I didn't know about alcohol, and, and I'm miserable, you know, I'm in school, and about the only time I'm happy is if, uh, you know, maybe I'm playing some baseball or something, which I wasn't good at or anything, but it made me forget about, you know, I knew what to do with my hands on the baseball field, or if I was playing music, you know, playing my guitar or whatever, you know, then I, you know, I could kind of, kind of escape into that stuff. But the rest of the time, I mean, I was, you know, I, I just didn't feel like I measured up. I wasn't the best at anything I did. You know, I was just, I was just average at, you know, pretty much everything. Now, what I know today is if I look back at it, I had this, I never put any effort into it. If I found out I wasn't going to be the top guy, I gave up completely. You know, it didn't matter what it was. If it was first grade reading books, some guy had read more than me, I gave up. You know, it's like, man, I can't catch this guy. I'm not going to be the number one guy, so why well, try you know, my sister, this, the one that's two years older than me, straight A's all through school, Moorhead Scholarship, the whole nine yards law school. I mean, you know, never, never done anything wrong, studied and all that. And, and I'm not blaming her for my alcoholism, but I could never measure up to her. There was no way. I was, I was doomed from the start. And I can remember, uh, I was thinking about this a while back. I've never really talked about this, but I can remember probably the first time I felt like you know, this alcoholism thing that we have is, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I heard a guy describe it as alcoholic self-pity is what we have. And, and, you know, a lot of people have self-pity, but alcoholic self-pity is that somehow we believe that our life is harder than everybody else's. And I can remember uh, down there where I grew up in Maxton, North Carolina, that if, you know, there was two first grade teachers, there was Miss Carter and there was Miss White. Now, if you got Miss Carter, I mean, that was the teacher you wanted. I can remember hearing them talk about this stuff. And I'm just a kid, you know, I'm coming up and I'm getting ready to go to kindergarten. And my sister's a couple of years ahead of me. And she, you know, she gets Miss Carter, of course, you know, and uh, I'm going through kindergarten and all this stuff. And I go for my first year of school. And guess what? I didn't get Miss Carter. I got Miss White. And I'm like, oh, God, my life is over, you know. And I mean, stuff like that just, I mean, you know, drove me crazy. And I can remember laying in bed at night worried about this. Like, what am I going to do, you know? I mean, I'm already, I'm in the first grade, I got the wrong teacher, my life is over, you know, I'm never going to make it, I mean, I'm not, what am I going to do when it comes time to move out, you know, how am I going to get a job, you know, which come to find out, I was 31 when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was still living at home, so I pretty much solved that moving out problem, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff I thought about, but, uh, you know, about, about 10, 12 years old, I was, me and some of my buddies, you know, we were already, I was already good at stealing, you know, I had that going on. I mean, I'd been stealing for a while, lying, stealing, cheating, you know, I'd been doing some, I probably would have done some other stuff if I would, would have had the availability to it. And, uh, but, uh, we got some alcohol and we stole it from my buddy's, uh, grocery store. And I had, I had sipped a few hot Budweiser's a couple of times, you know, on, you know, on camp outs or whatever, but I'd never gotten the effect produced by alcohol. And I'm here to tell you, I didn't drink because I liked the way it tasted. And I didn't drink because it looked cool. I drank because of the way it made me feel. And that night we camped out. We got some wine coolers or uh, malt duck or something like that. And, you know, I got it in me that night. And I got, I got, I had a spiritual experience. You know, I had exactly what I needed to make life bearable that night. And that was alcohol. And I can remember drinking that stuff and all those feelings I had went away one at a time, slowly but surely. You know, I felt, I felt like I was maybe you know, had some muscles or whatever, you know, I felt like, you know, maybe all those pimples were kind of disappearing, you know, I felt like my ears got a little smaller, you know, uh, I knew what to do with my hands, I mean, come on, you know, I, I had a drink in both hands, all of a sudden, hands have a meaning, you know what I'm saying, so I, I'm comfortable, man, I'm out here with these guys, and man, they're, they're not drinking like I am, and I'm thinking, these guys are not cool, I need to be somewhere other than here, you know, and I knew intuitively that if I was, you know, at the right place at the right time, I'd be able to talk to that girl I'd been staring at for two or three years, you know, and was afraid to go up to. Or, if, you know, if the preacher wanted to come talk to me about, you know, religion and all that, I could have a conversation with that guy right now. You know, I mean, I'm, 
I probably might even pray or something. You know, I might, I might, you know, I might be able to talk about that stuff. And you know, I loved it. I loved what alcohol did to, for me. You know, and, and that's why I drink, and that's why I kept drinking. Although, you know, when all these things that started happening that are results of alcohol, which has absolutely nothing to do with being an alcoholic, you know, the bad things, the DUIs, the the losing jobs, all the stuff that comes with abusing alcohol, you know, when all that stuff happened and, and most most sane people would take a look at it and stop, I had to keep doing it because I loved that feeling, you know, and I loved what it did for me. And no matter how bad all that stuff got for years and years and years, the pain of, of drinking and what happened was still more comfortable than not having alcohol, you know, being without alcohol and being ill at ease and not knowing nothing to do with my hands. and and not being able to be comfortable in any situation, you know. And I was willing to make that sacrifice, and I think that's alcoholism right there. Uh, you know, it was tough. i tell you what, it, it's kind of funny. I was thinking again, you know, the, the early days of my drinking were about like the latter days, you know. It was it was a struggle to get it, you know. I mean, wasn't nobody helping me out, you know. You're, you're 12, 13 years old in a Baptist home, and, you know, there's no bar. I mean, we don't have alcohol. I mean, what do you do? You know, Geritol? I mean, it's, you know, it'll get the job done if you drink enough of it. But, I mean, you know, I just, so I had to start finding friends that had uh, had alcohol in their house. So, you know, almost immediately I'm, I start changing who I hang out with, you know, and I let those guys go that I'd been camping out with because, I mean, their idea of fun was, you know, eating beanie weenies to see who could mouth the lavish fart. You know, I want to drink alcohol, you know. I mean, I ain't got time for these guys my own age. I, you know, so I had to start hanging out with some guys that were cool, you know. And, you know, it didn't matter. If you if you, if you you had access to alcohol, I, I went for it, you know. So I'd camp out or I would spend the night with guys. And and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the guys I started hanging out with, their parents had bars. And my early days of drinking would be basically when everybody went to sleep. I'd sneak down there and get, and get drunk at people's houses and then go back up and go to bed and, you know, the next morning nobody ever really knew what was going on. And uh, nobody ever questioned me about it and it was, it was awesome. So I was, you know, I was drinking by myself from the start, really. As the years went by, things started to get a little easier, you know, because um, some of my friends were a little bit older and you know, got on up into high school, you know, we, we had access to alcohol. And you know we would do the do the thing. I tell you, some of my earliest partying, I, 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 I met some guys over in the next town over in Laurenburg. I used, they had a skating rink over there, and, and a couple of my friends and me, we would go over and skate. And somehow I hooked up with these guys, and we ended up drinking and doing some stu other stuff out there in the woods behind the skating rink. And so I started making that my regular routine. This was way before I had driver's license, and. So the, the routine would be I would get money from my mom to go skating. They would have these all-night skating deals where they locked the thing down or whatever, you know, and she would drop me off with the money and my skates. I don't know if I ever used those skates. They were a nice pair of skates. And uh, as soon as she would pull off, you know, to go back to Maxton about seven miles away, man, I'd meet these guys. I'd throw my skates over in the woods, and we would party hardy, you know, all night long. The next day, whatever, I'd be out there waiting to be picked up all hung over. And, you know, I don't know if my parents were just – weren't paying attention or were naive or whatever, but I mean, it was, you know, they never really questioned anything at that point. <clears throat> but, uh, so that was, you know, some of the early stuff was, was hanging out over there and I, I really started doing a lot of stuff then. Uh, I was probably the first guy in my class that, uh, that was doing some of these things, you know, there was older guys and stuff at my high school, but my one, one good friend I had, his name was, uh, Charles, and he was, this kid was like 6'4 in the fifth grade and could dunk a basketball. He was a really good athlete, really good athlete. And, uh, but he hung out with me, and we were best friends. And his, uh, it was funny because, I mean, I was like really small, and this guy's like really big. And we went out, we did everything together. And I, I still to this day believe if he hadn't been hanging with me, he probably would have been in the NBA. But he, did, he ended up, uh, I think he still holds the North Carolina 1A scoring uh, single season scoring highest average that he had his senior year, but he ended, he his grades were all screwed up because he partied with me all the time. He ended up going to a smaller school and did all right there. But we hung out, we did a lot of stuff. So we was like, it was like funny, you know. Everybody always made fun of us because he was so big and I was so small. But the reason I'm telling this story, this is a good one here now. Uh, his grandmother was a root doctor, Miss Sarah down there, and uh. 
supposedly Charles told me he's like you know I like this girl and and uh, he's, he said you know if you if you if you go to Miss Sarah with one of her hairs she'll work a root on it and the girl will fall in love with you I was like no shit he's like well how much does that cost it's like five or ten bucks so I you know I scored up my lunch money and stuff and uh, uh, got the opportunity we're over at their house one night for a party you know and nobody was paying attention I ran upstairs and went in the bathroom got a hairbrush pulled out a couple of those hairs put them in my pocket and uh, <laughs> I went to Miss Sarah I was like Miss Sarah here's my ten dollars and I want this take these hairs I want I want her to fall in love with me and uh you know work work me a root or whatever and that's serious stuff now this ain't no joke and uh sure enough she did you know and uh nothing ever happened <laughs> Nothing ever happened, but her brother still calls me to this day. <laughs> and take a restraining order out on that paper. Nah, but uh, that's not a true story. But it really, his grandmother was a root doctor, and we, and uh, supposedly that that stuff really worked. I was always scared to go over there. I was afraid she put some kind of spell on me or something for hanging, making Charles get high with me. But <laughs> anyway. But, uh, man, I had a good time. I mean, it was, high school was awesome, and I, I stayed in a lot of trouble. You know, I was a bad guy. I was like a class clown, trying to get attention. But as long as, as, long as I had something in me, it was bearable. <coughs> so I ended up uh, not going to class quite a bit my junior year and, and got in a little bit of trouble, and they kind of looked the other way and called home, and I, I, I got probably got suspended several times for stuff, skipping school and this, that, Not, nothing major, you know, maybe some, you know, counterfeiting some lunch tickets, no, I mean, you know, just minor stuff. And uh, my senior year, I just, that really never started. I, I don't know if I ever actually went to any classes that year. I would, my, my younger sister was two years behind me and I, I would, my responsibility was get, drop, drive her to school, take the other two over to the, on the other side of town to the little elementary school, not the elementary, but whatever's below elementary. I guess it is elementary. They were both over there to different schools, about four or five miles away. So I would get them all to school, and my MO would be go party. I had I had a vehicle, so I was very popular, you know, and uh, come back, pick everybody up. And, and, and I got away with that for, I guess it was 30-some days before they made the call, you know, and they called like, you know, he's, What's up with this guy? He hadn't been to school this year. And I ended up going to night school. Now, night school is awesome if you're an alcoholic because uh, the teachers there were just basically people that couldn't get jobs at real school. And uh, all the girls there were usually the ones that had been pregnant and had you know, been out of school, had babies, and come back. And I'm not judging anybody from that, but they were, they were the kind of girls. You know, they were wild. And, uh, and it was guys like me that, you know, had quit going to school. It was guys that had been in reform school. It's like everybody there got high. I mean, it was like one big party at night school. And you would go in there, and they would call, call roll. And I don't ever remember actually doing any work. And I really I only needed one class to graduate, which was my senior English. So, I mean, it was, you know, I had it licked. I mean, it was like we'd go to night school. We'd get high before night school, go in, do the roll call, and then we would leave. And I ended up graduating. I did get a high school diploma by the grace of God, you know. And it wasn't anything I did to get that. I didn't deserve it. You know, I didn't earn it. But somehow I, 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 somehow I got it. So I'm out of high school now. And, and uh, you know, there's other substances in my story. And I respect for Alcoholics Anonymous. I won't mention that stuff. But I'm just here to tell you that short of uh, basically, I mean, if, it was, if they made it with, between 1975 and 1993, I probably did it. Uh, in fact, you know, me and my brothers, he had a truck there at the end, but they, they, could, they knew the sound of his truck over on the west side, and when they would hear us coming up Pennsylvania Avenue, they would all be out there waiting on us, all right? I mean, yeah, so there you go. That's where I was at. But... Uh, you know, just grateful to be sober, but, you know, things progressed. I ended up joining the Navy in 1983 and joined on the buddy plan with my good buddy, 
friend of mine, he was a little bit older than me, and we drank, he drank like I did, you know. I mean, a lot of the other guys were into a lot of other stuff down there, but we were, me and him just really wanted to get drunk. Now, we would get drunk, we would fight, and I mean, we didn't want to go anywhere to do anything or anything like that. We just wanted to drink, and we drank Jim Beam. Jim Beam was my drink of choice, and I loved Jim Beam, and I'm here to tell you. Uh, loved it. I mean, loved it. I mean, I'd drink Jack Daniels, I'd get sick. I'd drink uh, Evan Williams, I'd get sick. I'd drink any kind of white liquor, I'd go crazy. Moonshine, all that. But Jim Beam, I could drink it. I could drink it like it was tea, sweet tea. And, and I could pretty much maintain. I mean, I'd walk around with two fists of Jim Beam in me, you know, over a 24-hour period and, and never really do much more than just stagger and say stupid stuff. But, I mean, I, I just love Jim Beam, you know. Uh but we joined the Navy, we, went, we uh, went on the delayed entry program, and supposedly we were going to be buddy system deal, and something happened, and they backed him up, and I never did see him except one time, the whole time I was in the Navy, and that was, I had already graduated from boot camp, and he was just in there, and we passed each other, and he had to salute me, and I, I never saw him again till last September at a, at a class reunion thing, the first time I'd seen him since 1983, and he remembered. He remembered that. He remembered seeing me there. And, and man, I thought this guy was an alcoholic, but he ended up making it through the whole four years of the Navy. And uh, come to find out, he had gotten married and had a, had two kids that were in college and had been at the same job for all these years. And and uh, you know, doesn't even do anything but have a drink every now and then. I'm like, evidently, he was just hanging with me. Is what it sounded like. But uh, I would have sworn to you that this guy was an alcoholic just like me. But he drank like I did. But you know, I, I guess it just seemed like it. But I was glad to see him and 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 to know. And I told you know I, I made amends to him and and, uh, and told him what was going on with me. And you know, and and, and he's like, man, I'm glad to hear it. You know, because you really needed some help. But. Uh, <laughs> But stuff like that, you know, it seemed like everywhere as I went, you know, I ran into the same type of people, and, and, and it was always about let's party, let's party, let's party. But anyway, the Navy just, uh, I didn't make it. I got in trouble. I'm probably one of the few guys that got uh, got arrested twice for the same thing at the same time. And I, I got caught with some contraband coming off the ship in San Diego. And we had just gotten back from a Westpac, and I was taking it off the ship, it's, you know, they don't really, I mean, you got to be completely stupid to get busted taking something off a ship. You know, they check you coming on, but going off, you're pretty much free to walk. And I think somebody had turned me in or the rumor was around that I had it, but, but they charged me with smuggling it on and smuggling it off. And their, their whole rational about this deal was, now, technically, for you to smuggle it off, you had to smuggle it on. So that, and I did. It was in Malaysia, and I brought some stuff on board. And when we got to San Diego, I was trying to take it off, and they were just waiting for me to make the move, and, you know, I did, and they caught me. But by this time, I had already been in trouble several times, and, and I was down to my, my last strike. It was back during the three strikes you're out policy in the, the military had. And I had been on probation. I'm going to tell this story. I hadn't told it in a while. I'd been on probation, uh, what they call uh, 90 and 9, not 90 and 90, that's, that's AA, isn't it? Uh, I've been... Uh, where they take your money and they take your rank and you're on probation. They called it something, but I'd done back-to-backs on those. I'd done like 60 and 60 or whatever. So I hadn't had hadn't been off the ship like for like almost three months, something like that. And and it was my first night off probation. I was able to leave, and, and my, my best friend in the Navy, his name was Joe Boyd. <laughs> he was a signalman, third class. He was from uh, somewhere up in Kentucky, and, and he used to always tell the stories about how he rode mules down to the mailbox to check the mail and back up, and he was way up in the hills of Kentucky. He was a really cool guy, and he was married to this Filipino lady, and their kid was having his first birthday, and they were throwing a party. And he's like, man, I want you to come to the party. He's like, you know, you put, you know, you you got to maintain. You can't get too messed up because if you get in trouble, you know, everybody knew if I got in trouble again, I was going to be getting discharged. So I was like, yeah, Joe. I was like, man, I'll, I'll, I'll maintain, you know, and, uh, you know, I'll do good. I ain't going to drink too much. Well, we get to this party, and I don't even remember the kid seeing him or anything, but we started drinking, and I started drinking Jim Beam, of course. And I can remember us drinking the first fifth, and now you got to, I mean, 90 days is a long time to go if you hadn't drank anything. I mean, it hits you pretty hard. And I was pretty polluted, and I remember us leaving to go to the liquor store. And that's the last thing I remember. 
So we, the next, and I kind of remember coming in and out of a blackout and him carrying me up the gangplank onto the ship because I lived on the ship even when we were in San Diego. I didn't have, you know, no house out there or whatever or no burden or whatever. I lived on the, on the ship, you know, just like if we were at sea or whatever. That's where I stayed. And uh, the next morning I woke up and I, I mean, I was this maybe one of the drunkest I've ever been and, and I was still just, just terribly drunk. I couldn't hardly stand up. I felt like, like I weighed 200 pounds. I mean, it's like gravity was just pulling me back down. And 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 the only significant significant thing of this is our ship was getting ready to go into the into re into the, the yards where they re, re, redo the ship and tear it down and all this stuff. And and before they do that, they have a review and they have like some big wig and it, it just happened to be the the vice admiral of the of the seventh fleet was coming to. Uh, whatever it's called when you parade the ship or whatever we're supposed to be all you know up on our you know our a game and stuff this day with our uniforms on and all this and standing at you know and he's gonna come through the whole ship and look at it and this that and the other and I couldn't quite make it you know so uh, one of my guys looks at me he goes man you got we got to get you out of here he's like go down to the to the medical and, and see the see the uh, the corpsman and, and just tell him you're sick so I went down there and the guy looked, takes one look at me and everybody knew, you know, I mean, just a small shit. There was only like 400 guys on there. Everybody knew me. You know, I was a screw up. He's like, dude, he's like, here's your record. Go to dental. Get off the ship right now. And uh, I really meant to, but I just couldn't do it. I was too sick. <laughs> so uh, I go down below decks to where the uh, the Marine troops when we were, I don't know if anybody's ever remembers the Gomer Pile, but that's the kind of ship I was on where, the, where we had the Marines and they would climb over the side of the ship well, we kept them down. They slept below the water line during regular, you know. And I'm like, well, there's no way they'll come down here. I mean, there's, you know, nobody's going to come down here. I'm just going to go down here. I'm going to, you know, get in one of these bunks and just hide out and, you know, pass back out because, I mean, I'm sick. I mean, I'm bad. And that's what I did. And I don't know how long I was there or, or, or what, but the next thing I knew, somebody was tapping me on the shoulder. And when I opened my eyes, my captain, my executive officer, and about the vice admiral and about 20 of his guys that he travels with were all looking at me. Oh, and I'm, I mean, I'm, you probably could have smelled me from, you know, from the chow hall. I was so bad. So, I mean, that was, that was it. So, uh, so they sent me to another captain's mast. And here's the thing about the Navy was so funny. They didn't charge me with being drunk or disorderly or anything like that. I got charged with being unauthorized from my, from my dental appointment. So I'm probably the only guy that's ever been kicked out of the Navy for not going to the dentist. But that was it. They gave me another honorable discharge and a ticket back to North Carolina. And a bus ticket, not an airplane ticket. <laughs> so I come back to North Carolina and, you know, I'm, I'm uh, see, 83, 84. I'm, uh, I'm 20... 22, 23 years old, and I mean, I got a folder this thick that tells me that I've got a drug and alcohol problem. You know, it's right there in black and white. And I chunked that thing in the trash can at the airport or at the uh, bus station in Fable, and I never looked back. You know, it's like it's going to be different this time. You know, it will be different. My family had my, my dad had been transferred up here to Moore County. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna get away. It's you know, I'm not gonna be down here in Maxton. You know, all those people were bad influences i'm not gonna be here with all these navy guys because they drank way too much and uh, you know i'm gonna get up here i'm gonna get me some golf clubs and a couple of golf shirts and you know it's gonna be different you know meet a girl you know of course it's always that so you know i proceeded to to start terrorizing this county and <laughs> things didn't get any better you know i came and i, I immediately i'd never really drunk drank in bars where i grew up we drank out at you know, in the fields, at the tobacco barns, at the fire barrel. You know, we didn't have bars down there. And, and in the Navy, I really didn't drink in that many bars. I mean, we usually just, whatever place list they gave us of not to go to, that's where we went, you know. We, and, uh, you know, that, it was awesome. They'd give you directions to all the bad places. You know, don't go here, you know, don't get caught here. And all the cabs are headed there. But, uh, you know, so I, I'd never really been in bars, and up here in Southern Pines, everybody drinks in bars, you know, and I mean, I don't do good in bars, because when you chug a lot of Jim Beam, you know, and you're a redneck from Robinson County, you, know, you can't do that kind of stuff in a bar, you know, you can't go around pinching girls and all the things that come with that kind of activity, and it wasn't no time I'd been barred from every every decent place in Moore County, you know, uh, I've... 
I have never drank at the Tater Barn. That's my claim to fame. But I've been everywhere else, you know. Uh, Bruce's, Johnny's, I mean, you know, you name it. The Delaney's, the whole nine. You know, I drank at all of those. And uh, I got kicked out of all of them, too. But uh, by this time, my brother is... Uh, He's nine years younger than me, so he's 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 you know he's starting to participate in activities that I participate in. So there's two of us now, and things aren't good. Uh, get into construction, and start start doing a little heat and air work. I ended up doing electrical work. Uh, lost my driver's license. Got a DUI, like eighty, I want to say it was eighty five, eighty six, somewhere's in there, and, and ended up having to go. This is a good story here. Uh, we're uh, we this. This home group, we carry a message out to the minimum security prison out here at Morrison, and a couple of us, me and Ryan M. and, and a couple other guys, uh, Brent's been going with us, and, and Big Mike and stuff, and we were doing big, we do a big book study the first two weeks, and we were talking about something a couple of last month, and, and Ryan mentioned the mental health, something about the mental health over there. And I can remember having to go to the mental health and being embarrassed, you know, I didn't want nobody to see me over there at the mental health. It's over there in Pinehurst on the corner, you know. And my mama drove me over there, and I was like, pull around back, you know. And I was like, I get out of the car, and I'm like G.I. joe it up there to the mental health door. And I don't want nobody to know I'm crazy, you know. But heck, on Saturday night, I done been up there at damn uh, uh, Brooks Bar, drunk as hell. You know, shaking my money maker out there at girls and passed out on the sidewalk. So on Saturday night, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't care who sees me, but on Monday, I don't want to be insane. You know, that's alcoholism. So I thought it was, you know, kind of funny the way we live, you know. But uh, anyway, I'll get back to what I was talking about. But anyway, started working construction, this, that, and the other, and things. I just never, never achieved anything. I could never, I could never just pull it together. And I was thinking the other day. Uh, you know, I don't believe I ever left a job on good terms the whole time I was drinking, and and I was I was thinking about tonight about maybe trying to list some of the jobs I've lost because of of alcohol. And my first job that I ever really had was, you know, back when I grew up, they let the students drive the bus, and uh, I didn't have a bus route. I'm here. I mean, y'all be happy to hear that. But I was the monitor, and we drank on the bus. We drank cold beer while we had our bus route, and. We didn't get fired over the beer, but we did get fired for going too fast because we had rigged the governors on the bus. And the, somebody turned us in, the principal followed us one day. So that was the first job I ever had. And I'm probably pretty sure we wouldn't have done that if we hadn't been drinking. So I'm going to say that was alcohol related. I had another job out at this paper mill. Uh, and a friend of mine had got me, and we worked third shift. And I don't know if you, if you buy chicken, you know, there's a little mat set around it that absorb all the stuff. That's what we made. And the paper mills are, this place was highly, highly flammable. It was a very explosive environment because you got paper dust everywhere. And that place, it burnt down while we worked there. I'm not going to say how it happened. <laughs> it could have possibly been a, a seed popping. That's all I'll say. But, uh, so I lost that job over that. They couldn't prove it was us, but... They had a pretty good idea. Uh, the Navy obviously lost that job over alcohol. And then once I got into construction, it was always, you know, it, it may not have been directly related to alcohol, but it was always directly related to alcohol. You know, maybe not drinking on the job, but maybe not coming in for a week or something, you know, or, or whatever, or having a hangover just when I needed to be there. You know, I mean, you, you put an alcoholic, I mean, you know, critical situation now. Look, we've got to have our shit together this day. Guess what we do? We screw up. You know, we, we just know exactly when to mess up. So, I mean, you know, you, the list goes on. And then, you know, since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't left a job that I wasn't welcome to come back to. Isn't that amazing? You know, I haven't been fired from a job. Uh, I've had the same job for almost 16 years now. You know, that's, you know I work for myself, so it's kind of hard to get fired. But still, you know, I mean, you don't hear that much anymore. You know, hey, hey, man, we... I mean, some of these people have a different job every six months. But uh, I want to point that out to Kelly. She was talking about changing jobs at dinner tonight. But uh, anyway, stability, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, stability. But I'm going to fast forward. Uh, 92, my brother ended up going to treatment over here at the PTC, Pioneer's Treatment Center. And I, I, I came to visit him down here in Aberdeen. And uh, I didn't come to visit him to see him because I cared about him. You know, he, he called me up, said he needed... He needed a little something to help him, you know, make it through treatment. 
And I came down here to bring it to him. And they brought him in on the bus, you know, that blue bus that they had over there. And I sat back, right back there behind where Mark and them were sitting, probably, probably about where Karen's sitting, actually. And back then, the, they didn't have tables. The, the chairs were in rows, and there was a thing right down the middle. And, and I brought him what he needed to make it through treatment. And uh, I can remember, the only thing I remember about that meeting was getting up and going outside after the meeting, making the exchange. And uh, some kid... Uh, that was in Bethesda Link, big old, big, big African American kid named Buddy. I mean, he was a big boy. He came up and hugged me. I, I mean, I'm standing there trying to figure out what to do with my hands, of course. And he comes up and hugs me and uh, tells me he loves me. I'm like, oh, no, man. I was like, what is this shit? I, I'm like, where in the world? I mean, I don't want to be touched, much less hugged and told I'm loved, you know. Uh, I kept coming to meetings after that, you know. I didn't come back to see Buddy. I know what y'all are thinking. I came back because, uh, you know, the fellowship. I was attracted to the fellowship. And uh, that was like in November. And I kept hanging around, hanging around. My brother got out of got out of treatment and ended up relapsing. And we went back and forth. And, and, and I was hanging out down here at Aberdeen. It was during the marathon. And I loved it. It was awesome because you could come down here and hang out, and there was somebody here all the time. And <coughs> I'd go back home, catch a buzz, come back, eat cookies and stuff. You know, it was great. And you know, I was in love with the fellowship. I knew I knew I fit in. You know, and I started listening to the message a little bit. And I didn't believe I was alcoholic though. I knew I had some issues with some other stuff, but you know, I couldn't put couldn't put alcohol in place of. You know, and 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 I hadn't read that doctor's opinion. I didn't know what alcoholic was, and I was. You know, I was kind of like banking everything on what had caused me the problems. You know, and I didn't get in that much trouble on alcohol. I had that one DUI, but most of the time I was passed out drunk. You know, and I would do stuff like, you know, the party would start at 8, and I would be passed out at 6.30. You know, but I heard a speaker, Danny, from Houston talk about, he's like, if you've ever started drinking when you're already drunk. Now, how many of y'all have done that? I mean, I'd get up from a pass out and start drinking again, and I'd already be drunk. You know, I've done that a million times. You know, I love that blame sweet potatoes, but I've never gotten sick on sweet potatoes, eating so many I got sick and made myself throw up so I could eat some more. You know, I used to do that all the time on beer. You know, I ha I'd have to get sick on beer. I mean, I couldn't handle, couldn't hold enough to keep the level of buzz I wanted. You know, liquor wasn't that problem, but, but with beer, I, I couldn't drink enough fast enough to stay where I wanted to get. And, uh, you know, stuff like that. I started hearing hearing a lot of things, and I ended up getting a sponsor. You know, I got I got introduced to Mr. Raymond, and uh, this guy took me under his wing. You know, and he did a classic twelve step call on me, just like it talks about in the big book, and and not a twelve step call, but but he set me up for my interview the first night when I met him, and gave me his number, and was like, you know, make me Sunday, and we'll, we'll you know we'll sit down and talk. And I thought he was going to interview me, you know, to see if I was quality material to be his sponsee. <laughs> And he never talked, never asked me one question about my drink, and he told, told me his story, you know, and he talked about things that had happened to him and, and how it had, you know, how he had drank and all the things. And, and, and right at the end of, of him telling me all this stuff, he, he, his wife had died like six, eight months before, before he met me with leukemia. And I can remember thinking, man, why is this guy, why is he not drunk? You know, why is he not drunk? I mean, you know, isn't that the damn, don't they have that in the rule book? If that happens, you get their drink. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but I had a list of about 10 things, and if they happened, I, it would be, you know, it would be acceptable to drink early on. You know, surely, sure enough, all, just about all those things have happened to me in sobriety other than a death in the family, and I haven't drank, you know, because at the time those things came along, you know, sobriety was more important. But, uh, so I got hooked up with Mr. Raymond, and, and, and man, this guy was involved. He was in AA. He wasn't just attending meetings. This guy was in AA. You know, he was active. He chaired meetings. He went everywhere and spoke. And he took me with him. You know, we'd go to Red Springs. We'd go to Rockingham. We'd go to Hamlet. We'd go to Bisco. I mean, just like two, three times a month, he was out of town speaking. And we would spend an hour going down there talking, and we'd spend an hour at the meeting, and we'd spend an hour coming back, you know. And, and what happened with that deal is I began to trust another human being. You know, I would tell him little tits and tats of my story, and I would wait for somebody to come back to me with it, you know, because I was just waiting for an excuse to go drink. And, uh, you know, he never told anybody anything. None of that stuff ever left, left that car. March the 18th, 1993, uh, 
I'd been on, uh, me and my brother had been on our last run. And, you know, uh, I don't know what started it. I'd never been able to put more than five days together between that December or that, that late November when I started coming. You know, I put about three or four days together and I would, you know, I'd have a slip here and there. And uh, I was picking up some white chips, but, you know, I was also picking up chips, being dishonest chips, you know, 30, 60 day chips that weren't, weren't earned. And, uh, you know, my brother tried to kill himself and, and we were over at the emergency room in, in, at the hospital and I'm not done yet, you know, I'm ready to keep rolling, you know, I mean, shoot, well, I'm not, and, I, and I got a resentment, you know, I'm mad, my brother's in here getting his stomach pumped, I don't know if he's going to live or die, and all I can think about is, man, he's messing it up, well, I'm going to keep getting high. And, uh, you know, I had a moment of clarity, and I realized how insane that was, it's like how unmanageable my life was, you know, and I was like, man, these people in AA, I was like, I got to, you know, I got to do this deal, you know, I can't live like this anymore. You know, I'm 31 years old, I'm living in my parents' basement, you know, I barely got a job, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I just would have been better off dead. And I really, you know, I thought about dying a lot more than I did living. Uh, took the third step prayer that night with my sponsor over the phone. And, uh, you know, I haven't had to have a drink since. Came down and got a white chip. Bill C. gave me my last white chip. God bless him. Man, man helped me a lot. Died back this summer. Uh, you know, and got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, started chairing meetings, started making coffee, started uh, doing things around this building, uh, worked at Bethesda for a little while, part-time at night, you know, as uh, driving guys to meetings, and that kept me in meetings, you know, I hated it, but it kept me in meetings, I did that for about six months, and, you know, slowly but surely, my life started getting better, and, uh, you know, went through the steps with my sponsor, uh, went through the steps another time in a big book study with a bunch of guys and uh you know have been able to been able to stay sober i've sponsored guys you know i've been in service i've you know i haven't had a whole lot of success i've had a, had a sponsee die get sober uh he got sober did good went back to school got his architectural license and all this was doing great and I forgot all about aa you know didn't go to meetings and they found him with a needle in his arm you know dead you know a couple of years later you know, and the guy had quality sobriety. I mean, he'd been sober seven or eight years. And, you know, that just shows me that if, if I don't stay in this program, what'll happen? You know, it can happen to anybody sitting in here tonight. Uh, you know, I'm real, just as active now, more active now than, than I ever have been in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. After 20 years sober, you know, I, I, I attend prison corrections meeting on a weekly basis. I go to detox. You know, I'm on a detox rotation with that, with another home group that uh, that we we're, we're kind of like joint venturing on, and uh, we're grateful to, that they let us participate in that. Uh, you know, I've got a position in what's my what did I do in the home group? I'm something. <laughs> oh, I'm steering committee rep for the home group now. I've done everything else. They won't let me have the money. I'm pissed off about that a little bit, but anyway, there's always next year. But. Uh, you know, let Kelly take care of check, but they wouldn't trust me with it. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, I've I've been on, I've been GSR, I've, I've held a position at the district level. Uh, you know, and there's there's always some new challenge. I'm real excited. I was telling Kelly and Richard about it tonight. Uh, we the the meeting we carry out to Morrison is a minimum security, and it's a, it's mostly kids that are like 18 to 26. But we've got <laughs> We've got some guys there that are on a construction crew that are minimum security, and they're older guys, and they've they they've been some of the guys have been sober a while, and there's one guy there that's got 16 years sober, but he's in prison, and I'm here to tell you right now this guy's free as anybody sitting out here tonight, and he asked me to sponsor him while he's down here at Morrison for the next year uh, Wednesday night, and I'm excited about it because I know I'm gonna I'm gonna have a spiritual experience with this guy, you know. And, and uh, he needs to be sponsoring me is the real truth from talking to him. This guy's on top of it. I mean, he's, uh, he, he's really working a good program. He came from Wilmington. They have five meetings a week there, you know, five meetings a week. He said there's volunteers, like, fighting over who gets to go. And I wish we had that problem here. But uh, we don't. But, uh, you know, I'm just grateful to be in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, to be sober today. Uh, you know, I haven't had to have a drink, haven't thought about a drink. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful day to be sober. And even if it is going to rain, I love to I like rainy days, actually, to be honest with you. Nothing better than drinking liquor on a rainy day, I'm telling you. Go ahead, Buster.
<laughs> All right, raise your hand. <laughs> but uh, that means we didn't have to work, you know. I mean, if it was raining, heck, you draw a circle. If one drops in there, we're going to the liquor store, you know what I mean? Construction. <laughs> Shit, I'd spit and get that drop going. But anyway, thanks for letting me share. <laughs>